gave Jesus. The world's stingiest man went Christmas shopping, but everything was too expensive except a $50 vase that was on sale for $2 because the handle had been broken off. He bought it and had the salesman ship it by mail so that his friend would think he had paid $50 for it and that it had been broken in shipment. A week after Christmas, he received a thank you note from his friend, which read like, read like this. Th thank you for the lovely vase, his letter said. It was so nice of you to wrap each piece separately. <laughs> God gave Jesus. He did not sell him, loan him, or rent him. God gave Jesus before we ever thought about it. He saw us for what we were, saw what we needed, and made the commitment. Jesus even gave himself. He didn't give part of himself. He gave his whole self. In fact, from number, our first point this morning is he gave his very best. God gave his very best. How much does God value you? How much does God value me? I think about Jesus' prayer in John 17. In John chapter 17 Verses 20, uh, verses 20 through 23. Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, specific, on, uh, specifically his disciples, but for those who also believe in me through their word, that includes you and me, that they may all be one, even as you are, Father are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved them me. I think about the great text that so many have memorized in John 3.16 that goes along with this. For God so loved the world. Explained in this way, for God so loved, how, how much did he love the world? That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. Matthew 16, 26 says, For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would we exchange our own lives over for? Do we see the value of our own soul, the, the value that God has placed upon us? That he's given his very best, and so we we give our we give our best to be more like him and to improve our lives because that's how much he loves us. We need to see that value that God sees us as, how much he has valued us. He has done it everything he has done within himself, everything possible, so that we could be with him. He loved us so much. I thank God for his love. God doesn't ask us something that is impossible. God doesn't give us something that we can't, that are, as, as, the, as the writer of 1 John says, that are burdensome. They are reasonable things that he asks us to do. I think about Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Is Yahweh pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does Yahweh require of you? But to do justice, to love loving kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. It's not about just doing something to, to do something. 
but because we love God. God wants our whole heart. He wants us to do what's right, to, be, to love loving kindness and to be hum humble. 1 Peter 1, and, 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 and think about this. Look at our own redemption. Look at the redemption of man. Notice the price that was paid as when we observed the Lord's Supper. We remember that death that, was, that death that Christ paid for us. That His blood was shed for us. And Peter acknowledges this in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold. We weren't, we weren't bought with worldly things. But with what? Notice the latter half of this, uh, of ver uh, notice in verse 19. But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, specifically, this blood is the blood of Christ, the perfect sacrifice. We have been bought with Christ's life blood. That simplifies, that shows how much God loves us. When God gave Jesus, he gave, his, he gave His best. We are not cheap or trivial in God's eyes. We're not like that broken vase. God see, we, we, though we are broken at times, God makes us back whole. We're not cheap or trivial in God's eyes. No matter who we are or what we have done in our past, God takes us seriously. God values us. In fact, Peter also says in a second in a second letter in Second Peter three nine, uh, 19, or three nine, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My memory is correct. I think about Ezekiel 33, 11, where it says, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God wants all of mankind to be saved. But it's up to man to choose to accept the gift, to be obedient. God didn't make us like robots that we, that we just programmed to do all of a sudden uh, beyond our will. He's given us the choice. We always have a choice. We need to give our best in And in fact, Paul describes this describes God's love even further in Romans chapter five. Romans five specifically verses six through eight. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would, would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. How? In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God loves us. It does not say that he, because we are perfect, He died for us. While we were yet sinners, He died for us. He gave His very best when God gave Jesus. But also number two, He gave, when God gave Jesus, He gave because you need Him. Where would we be without Jesus. We would be without hope. We would be without salvation. We would be lost. Man has a very difficult time thinking like God thinks, seeing as God sees and understanding what God understands. God knows us because He made us. That's the very first two or three chapters of Genesis. Where it shows how God made the world and the things that are in the world, the stars, everything that we see, and He made you and me. God knows us. He knows what makes makes us go. And and because God knows us, because He has made us, 
He knows, he knows how much we need Him. Most don't realize how much they need God. We need God physically for air, water, food, clothing, shelter, health. We need God spiritually for grace, guidance, and help. Salvation and many others that we can look at. And we also need God emotionally for hope, for peace, for love. Next week we're going to follow this up with the gifts that God has given us. But think about what God has given us through His Son Jesus and it shows how much we need Him. Without God, we would have none of these things. We wouldn't have air, water, food, clothing, shelter, grace, guidance, help, hope, peace, love. In the very same chapter of Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it talks about having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us peace. We need Jesus. We need God. And we need to see that. We need to see that in our own lives every day that we need Him. The day that we, the day that we come to the conclusion we don't need Jesus is the day we're in trouble. We always will need Jesus until we draw our last breath. We're often told to be independent, to trust no one, or be your own person. Some have taken this to mean we don't need God. And some, and most in our world live like that. Like, we, I don't need God. I can do it myself. I'm a self-made man. I can do whatever I want to. Man today rejects authority and rejects God's gift for their lives. And don't, under, don't understand, don't see that, that how much they need God, how much they need Jesus. I think about Jesus' letter to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3. May we never be like some, some in our world who, who, do, who, who see themselves as, I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. May we always be concerned with our needs that we need Jesus. If we didn't need Jesus, God sent to God would not have given Jesus. The, church, the letter to the church at Laodicea is written, To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, This is what the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What was going on? They had become satisfied with who they were and, and, and stopped growing in their lives. They, they failed to see that, that they needed Jesus every day. They, weren't neither, they, were, they, were, they were not useful. They were not hot nor cold. They were kind of in the middle. They were standing on the fence, if, if you think about it that way. And the letter says, because of this, they're lukewarm. I will spit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Look at what I've got. I've got this nice fancy house. I have these nice cars. I have a nice bank account. I don't need anything. That sounds like one of the parables that Jesus told about this man that, that had these crops and he's wanting to, and his barns are all full and he said, I'll, here's what I'll, here's what I'll, and he's, he's, he's relaxing and he takes his ease. Of course, he's, he says, uh, I'll, build, I'll tear down these barns and build bigger barns. And the whole conclusion is that Jesus said this night, your soul is required of you. You kind of have this, you kind of have this attitude of the church of Laodicea. We, have, we are rich. We have need of nothing. May we never have that attitude. I have need of nothing. We will always have a need. Always. We will always need Jesus. We will always need God. Finishing out this verse. And you don't know what you are you are wretched and pitiable, pitiable and poor and blind and naked. 
So the reality was they thought, we're rich. We have even nothing. And God says, you need something. And you don't realize how much you need it. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be manifested and I shall to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We need Jesus. God gave Jesus because we need him. One said of God, you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests with you. The prodigal son woke up in a pig pen and found he needed home and he needed God. The rich man who harvested much and was going to build bigger barns found out one night his soul belonged to God. Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews, member of the Sanhedrin, teacher of Israel, was told you must be born again. Hezekiah, facing death, turned his face to the wall in tears and prayed to God. The tax collector standing in the temple, but ashamed to lift up his eyes in prayer, smote his breast and prayed, God be merciful to me, the sinner. We need God. We need God. Galatians 1, 3-5 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us out of this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. He gave Jesus. Jesus gave Himself for our sins. So that we can have deliverance. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Not only when God gave Jesus, He gave His very best, not only when God gave Jesus because we need Him, but He also gave His love to change our lives. I think about Ephesians 2, 1-10. through 10. Stop for a moment as we consider Ephesians 2. Think of who you were, but also think of who you are now. And notice a change in our own life. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were. Notice where you were. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the rulers of the power of the air. The Spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience among whom we all also formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love, what a great love it is that God has for man, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. 
We were dead in our trans, trans, transgressions and sins. But now we've been made alive. We've been brought back. We've been redeemed. We've been reconciled. We've been saved by God's dear grace. Through faith. That's God's love. He gave His love to change our lives. And that change is constant. Think about the cross as well. Jesus suffered that agony on that cross. The cross has a unique and wonderful power over our lives. In times of pride, it humbles us. In times of guilt, it reminds us of His forgiveness. In times of loneliness, it reassures me of His constant concern. In times of anger, it reminds us of His patience. In times of apathy, it stirs our souls. In times of fear, it reassures us. In times of pain, it helps us to know God understands our pain. In times of worry, it gives me hope. Think about what God has, has done through Jesus for us. And what the cross means, it's more than just a necklace. It's a death symbol. It is the ultimate display of God's love. That He gave His very lifeblood for you and me. Jesus said it Himself, Greater love has no man than this than to lay down His own life for His friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He gave His life. He, said it all. he also said it Himself, No man takes my life. I give it. I'll lay it down willingly. Well, he had the power to, he had the power to take, take his own life and he also had the power to, give, uh, to, to take it up again. He even said it after he got through praying out of the garden. He said, can I not just ask my father and he would not get me at once legions of angels? But he went through it willingly. Why? Because he saw beyond the cross. He saw the souls of man. He saw, he, he saw love. That's his love displayed through the cross. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how will He also not with Him freely give us all things? God didn't even spare His own Son, but He gave Him for us. He didn't hold Him back. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that they who live should, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. When you and I became believers, became Christians, when we come up out of that watery grave of baptism, we are no longer our Selves. We are no longer living for ourselves. We are living for Christ, the one who bought us. And we view that and we and, and, and we, we live that way out of viewing his love and our love for him. God knew the best way to reach and bring about the change in the life of people was by loving them. And again, that ultimate display was through the cross. I think about this. It's called the north wind and the sun. The north wind and the sun disputed as to which was the most powerful and agreed that he should be declared the victor who could first strip a wayfaring man of his clothes. The north wind fir first tried his power and blew with all his might, but the, but the, the keener his blast, the closer the traveler wrapped his cloak around him until at last, resigning all hope of victory, the wind called upon the sun to see what he could do. The sun suddenly shone out with all his warmth. The traveler no sooner felt his rays, and he took one garment off after another, and at last, fairly overcome with the heat, he, he bathed in the stream that lay in his path. And the lesson of that is, is that persuasion is better than force. 
Persuasion is better than force. How did God persuade man? Through Jesus. Through His Word. You and I are not forced to do anything. You and I read the Word of God and see God's great love. And out of our view of His great love and how we view ourselves, how we, how we see ourselves in that moment, realizing I need God, I need Jesus, I need to change my life, we become members of His body and are changed. And that change is constant. We have to continue to grow. That's what Peter said at the end of his letter. But grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to grow and to continue on. What does God hope for us? God hopes that we will love Him enough to change our life. He gave up Jesus because He had hope and confidence in you. He, knew that we can, he knows that we can do it. You can do it. And you can continue to live for Him. What, what a confidence boost that is for the child of God. So as we can draw this lesson to a close, how has the love of God changed your life? And more importantly, has the love of God changed your life? As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, let a man examine himself and see whether he's in the faith. Let us, let us reflect on what's been said this morning and examine our own lives. How do we see the love of God? When He, when God gave Jesus. That song that we normally sing sometimes before the Lord's Supper has this line, I gave my life for Thee. My precious blood I shed that Thou mightst ransom me and quicken, that is, made alive from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for Thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave. I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Take just a moment to reflect on how God's love has changed your life. And if you have a need to respond to this invitation this morning, it's here now as we, we ask you to come this time to as we stand and encourage one another in song.